I know that this is a photography channel, but before we go on ahead, it helps to take a step back and find out where photography got its origins. That's why I'm calling this episode Negative One, and we're going to be talking about the camera obscura. But since this is a topic about optics, I think we should use some visual aids. So what is a camera obscura? In Latin, it translates to dark room, and although it's not really a camera in the traditional sense, all of the workings are there. So let's start with a room with a window on one wall. Outside this window, let's say that we have a tree. Something like this. And we have some light that comes from the sun. Let's just say. So you probably have a room like this in your house or your apartment or wherever, and it's nothing really special because light comes into the window and just fills the room with light. But something special happens when we make this window sufficiently small. So if we take this window, and instead of a big, large opening, we make a very small hole, something like that. What we notice is that an image is going to be projected through the hole onto the opposite wall, and that image is going to be upside down and backwards. So our tree is going to look something like this. Here's the base of our tree, something like that. So why does this happen? Why when we have a small opening does it project an image onto the opposite wall, whereas before with the large window we didn't really see a, a sharp image. We just saw light enter the room. Well, if we make the hole small enough, what happens is that the light from the sun hitting the tree and the tree is reflecting green light in all directions. However, with a small hole, only the light that's traveling in, in, in a singular direction is going to be projected onto the back wall. Before, it was heading in all directions through the window and it was just filling the room with light. But here, because the hole is small, only the light that comes from these points traveling in this direction will actually make it through that hole. Same goes for the, the base of the, the same goes for the base of the tree here. It can only go in this direction. The light that comes from the base that's hitting the wall doesn't go through because it doesn't have anywhere to go. So here you can see why the light from the top of the tree is projected upside down and the base is also upside down. This gives us a reverse image. Now this phenomenon had been documented thousands of years ago by Chinese, Middle Eastern, and Greek philosophers, but it really didn't gain popularity or traction until about the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a period in art history between about the 14th and 17th centuries where there was really a boom. And I'm not really an art historian, but if you look at the works from that period, you can definitely tell there was a trend towards trying to make paintings, drawings, and images more realistic. There were a lot of studies into things like perspective. 
And it's been theorized that artists actually employed optics and technology like this in order to aid their drawings and paintings. And you can see why this would be such a valuable tool to artists who are trying to recreate scenes. Because if you point this pinhole at something, what you're going to do is you're going to get a resulting image on the far wall that is both correct in terms of perspective and it preserves color. Now, the reason it's called the camera obscura and it refers to a dark room is because with such a small opening, only a little bit of light is getting through. So because of that, you know, these images would be very, very faint, very dim on the far wall. So the rest of the room would have to be void of any light uh, in order to actually see the image. Now, there were optics at the time, and we know this because of microscope developers and, and the like. So you could actually replace this hole with a, a lens, you know, a, a, a converging lens that would focus the light and allow a larger opening, allowing more light in. And then you didn't have to just put your piece of paper and trace it on the wall you could have another sort of mirror here that would point this to maybe you have your, your piece of paper or your canvas here and it would actually focus the light and make it a much brighter image making it easier to transfer. Now the fact that technology like this existed and artists may have employed it does cause some controversy in the art world because the thought is well was it the artist really painting this scene or were they just simply tracing it uh, from this projection. Some of the works from the classic Renaissance painters is actually brought into focus that they may have used techniques like this in, in a great book by David Hockney entitled Secret Knowledge, Rediscovering the Lost Techniques of the Old Masters. Now the argument that David makes is that the, the level of skill involved in the painting at the end of the Renaissance sort of takes a, a jump all of a sudden we have these images that are extremely realistic, very correct in terms of color and perspective. Um, but sometimes even those images show sort of artifacts of what a lens might do to a scene. And those sort of artifacts are incorporated into the painting. Things are out of focus or they have chromatic aberration. These wouldn't happen if you were painting it by hand or, or sort of by eye. But if you were using a tool like this, and you incorporated that tool into your painting, you'd have these sort of artifacts. And the controversy stems from the fact that, well, are these artists sort of cheating in a sense? Are they using this tool uh, and sort of tracing the image that they see? Is that really true mastery of the art? And I'll just read the excerpt from the back cover, which I think sums it up nicely. It says, the lens can't draw a line. Only the hand can do that. The artist's hand and eye in coordination with his heart. This whole insight about optical aids does not diminish anything. It merely suggests a different story, a more accurate one, perhaps. Certainly a more interesting one. And I really do think it's interesting because why wouldn't you use the latest and greatest technology to get more realistic images? And this is why we study the camera obscura because this is, at its essence, the beginning of photography. All that we have to do is replace this wall with film or a, a digital sensor and we basically have a camera and I think it's important to know that at its very onset photography was about making a lasting tangible image and people wanted to capture exactly what they saw without having to sit there and paint it or sketch it or draw it they wanted an exact representation of the world around them and as we look at the history of photography the very beginnings of it was more concerned about getting things accurate, getting things right, reproducing the exact scene. And as photography has evolved, photography is further and further about truth and more about artistic expression. But at its very core, people wanted to capture the world around them as they saw it. And that's how it started and it, it's very fascinating to watch how photography has evolved since then. Especially now in today's age, with things like Photoshop and digital manipulation being easier than ever, you know, is there any truth for, to photography anymore? Uh, that's, that's an argument for another day, and we're definitely gonna talk about that. But it's very important to know these optical principles, even without a lens, even with just a pinhole, how they can produce these images. And all we have to do to create a real camera in the sense that we know today is have something that can capture this image due to these optical properties. So how do we get from this camera obscura to a camera as we know it today? 
Well, let's take a look at something like this. Now, this is a view camera, but essentially you can think of this as a camera obscura because it has a opening in one end, this is the lens, and it has sort of a, a wall that the image is projected on. This is a ground glass viewing screen. And in the middle is a dark room, a dark box. So let's take a look at how this employs the principles that we see in the camera obscura. And these, these are essentially the same thing, except that this can accept film and can actually record the image that it sees, whereas this was just used as an optical drawing aid. So as you can see, we have some flowers set up here in studio with our view camera. And remember, the view camera is just basically a camera obscura. The only difference is that there's a lens on the front of this one, not a, not a pinhole. And it's a dark chamber. And instead of the wall of the room that we were talking about, we have this, this view screen. So if we get in here, I'm going to have to bump up the ISL, but you're going to see that the image is inverted. So we have an upside down image, but it preserves the perspective and the color of what we're looking at. I hope you enjoyed that video about the camera obscura and how it segues nicely into photography. Remember, all we have to do is add some sort of material that's sensitive to light that can capture the image in a camera obscura and then we have a camera and then we can start making real photographs. I'm also planning on releasing some videos about how to make your own camera obscura so you can use it as a tracing tool or just see how optics work and get a feel for what your camera is actually seeing. If you're interested, let me know in the comments down below. I also recommend picking up a copy of this book. I'll leave a link to it in the description down below. But honestly, it's a really interesting read and it gives some insight into what tools were available at the time when these Renaissance painters were, were creating their masterpieces and kind of gives an insight as to really the birth of photography. There's also a great movie called Tim's Vermeer where a guy with little to no painting experience sets out to recreate a masterpiece using some of the technologies like the camera obscura and the camera lucida. Next week, we'll get into a little camera history. And until then, happy shooting. Wait, was there film in here? If you like the content you saw today, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, I'll put a link to the trailer for that movie that I was talking about here. And if you didn't catch my first video, check it out here.